Okay, the recording started now. Thanks. Um, so I'm chairing the meeting this evening. I'm Kerry Jenkins, one of the councillors for Mosley. I'm also accompanied by Councillor Martin Straker Wells and uh, numerous presenters who are all here to share information with us. So I want to welcome residents who have joined us. I'm expecting uh, a few more that will join us as we work our way through the agenda. And uh, thank you for being patient. I just do need to advise you um, that the, this meeting will be recorded and it will be available for future reference. Um, this is a Teams meeting which will allow residents to ask questions if they would like to, but I do ask that um, you put your hand up if you can, if you want to ask a question and stay on mute until you're called, that would be wonderful. So um, bearing in mind that we've got a number of people joining us uh, to offer us this information, I'm going to crack on with uh, welcoming Gavin Smith from the West Midlands Rail Executive. And Gavin has offered to give us an update on the progress of the much awaited Mosley station. And I know that we're all very excited to hear. So, Gavin, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Um, could I, uh, and um, I'm sure you can all hear me. Um, you'll see I'm actually broadcasting live from my car in a car park. Um, but I uh, do apologise for that. Um, I'm going to work with Kay, who's actually, um, because of the logistical difficulties of running a Teams meeting from my car in a car park, um, I'm going to ask Kay to share the screen with my presentation and then I'll talk through the presentation slide by slide and then I'm happy to take any questions at the end, if that works. OK, if you just give me a minute, Gavin, it's just loading now. Hopefully you'll be able to see it in a second. There you go. Thank you. OK, so uh, well, that's just the introductory slide, of course. Uh, so next slide, please. So um, I'm sure you're all aware now um, of the um, proposal, um, but the proposal is to reopen three stations on the Camp Hill line in South Birmingham. One of them is Mosley. The other two are Hazelwell and Kings Heath, and the map there shows you the location of those three stations on the Camp Hill line, and I've also indicated the location of Birmingham New Street. So these stations will be open at the same time, that's the plan, and they will be served by trains running backwards and forwards between Birmingham New Street and Kings Norton, calling at all stations. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. OK, now some of you have probably seen this before, but I think it's worth just to um, refresh people's memories on what we're actually doing at Mosley and what you're going to get at the end of the um, project. So firstly, this is a, um, an, a drawing. Uh, of the agreed um, access from the station to the local highway network on St Mary's Road. And we did have lengthy debate with stakeholders in Mosley about how best to link the station to the local highway network. And I'm really pleased to say that we came up with a solution that um, was agreeable to all stakeholders. Um, and that's in the form of a roundel, uh, which fits nicely into the streetscape. Um, it's, it, it, I think it really has a, an excellent sense of place uh, in the uh, locality. And off of that roundel will be St Mary's Row, Oxford Road, and uh, the new station pick up and set down facilities. And the diagram shows you uh, how that will work. Now, this, of course, has been subject to uh, planning um, permission uh, through Birmingham City Council. That was achieved back last September. So these are the plans that we will be developing further. Um, and I'll come on to what we're doing and when we're doing it. But these are the plans we'll be developing further as far as the 
access to the local highway network is concerned. Next slide, please. So we've got some images now. Some of you would have seen these before, but again, I think it's really important just to um, show everybody what the station will look like once complete. And the next three slides are computer generated images produced by the designers Mott McDonald, who've been working with us so far on the uh, station designs and the engineering side of things. So here we are at the front of the station. We've just got out of, for example, a car in the pick up and set down area, or we've walked in from St Mary's Row, or we've cycled in from St Mary's Row. You can see this is an artist's impression of the forecourt. We're currently above the tunnel. Uh, towards the back of the picture, you can see the National Rail sign. Um, the square block will be on the left is one of the lifts leading down to the platforms. Of course, all of the platforms are fully accessible. Um, and on the left, you'll see a um, fairly um, sort of healthy supply of um, cycle storage, which we believe will be well appreciated by the uh, passengers using the station. We're trying to create a bright and welcoming uh, forecourt area where people you know, feel attracted to come and sit. Maybe uh, people work locally, uh, might want to sit and sort of relax there. So we want that to be a bright, uh, open and welcoming uh, entrance gateway, if you will, to the station. Next slide, please. So this is um, actually just you're effectively walking a bit further round the roundel and looking back across at that uh, cycle facility. Uh, you can see here that the um, artist impression shows some sort of pop up kiosks, which may or may not uh, happen depending on what retailers um, take advantage of that. But I think the thing that you know is, is worth pointing out here is that this is quite actually a, a sizable space and it's a space that can actually be used by the local community to benefit the local community. So, you know, it's possible that we could have pop up markets or stalls uh, there at some stage in the future. Um, so we're creating, uh, I think, a facility that is actually more than just a railway station entrance and forecourt here, which I think is really attractive. Next slide, please. And now we're down on the uh, platforms. So here you'd actually be a passenger on the southbound platform waiting for a train to King's Heath, Hazelwell and King's Norton. You're obviously looking towards the uh, existing tunnel, which remains. Uh, you can see here the new platforms canopies, unlike ma the majority of new stations where uh, shelters tend to be provided. What we're providing here are canopies of about 40 to 50 metres in length. So that's roughly sort of if you say is about two carriages worth. Uh, now that is actually, I think, a, a really positive thing for passengers, particularly in wet weather, um, but also it has an operational benefit as well because passengers can spread more evenly along the platform rather than huddle in a waiting shelter. So when the train arrives, the boarding is far quicker than it would otherwise be. So there's some practical, but more importantly, there's some customer benefits there. And you can see uh, at the back the lift shaft with the national rail symbol on it adjacent to the steps. And as I said, uh, all stations are fully accessible. Next slide, please. Uh, well, it's no good having a station unless you've got a train service. And I mentioned that we would be running trains every 30 minutes along the route. And the proposal is to use new class 196 diesel units that are um, in rapidly being constructed. Um, these are uh, built by the Spanish train builder CAF, who incidentally also built um, the trams in Birmingham, and they're being completed and fitted out in CAF's special facility that they've invested in in Newport in South Wales. So um, these are very bright, modern, state-of-the-art, attractive trains again fully accessible and uh, got great modern facilities uh, on board. Yes, they are diesel, but um, as we all know, the line is not electrified, um, so we can't operate electric trains. 
So we're operating a brand new diesel fleet. These are the latest diesel engines with low emissions. Next slide, please. So this all sounds very good, but it costs a lot of money, obviously, to build uh, three new railway stations. They do not come cheap. But uh, I am really pleased to say that in the budget, the last budget, um, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak announced, and it was actually, this is lifted straight from the budget, um, investment in local railways and stations. The government will invest 59 million towards the construction of five new stations in the West Midlands, cutting journey times from Willenhall, Darleston and southwest Birmingham into the city centre. So when the Chancellor says southwest Birmingham into the city centre, he means the three stations on the Camp Hill line. The contribution from the government, that's the Department for Transport, was 59 million. And I'm really pleased to say that for both of the packages, that's the Willenhall and Darleston in the Black Country, but also uh, what we're talking about here, both of these schemes are fully funded and that is a really important milestone and a really excellent place uh, to be. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, confirm that. Next slide, please. So um, we've got um, some pictures here of the devegetation works that took place in early March. Um, we, I think all residents are probably aware that these works took place. Here's some pictures um, of the work being carried out. Of course, it was absolutely necessary to do this work in order to prepare the site for the construction of the new station. Um, we only took down the trees that we needed to take down. So you'll see that trees have been left high up on the top of the embankment. Um, Clearly, you can't build a railway station um, with lots and lots of trees in the vicinity. So that's what we needed to do. Um, for those of you um, who, who've asked about the um, environmental and ecological impact of that, we did have an ecologist on site during the works. Um, we've had very detailed ecological reports produced. Um, it was at the very, very start of bird nesting season and any trees that were assessed to have nesting birds in them were left untouched. So I can reassure everybody with uh, an interest in the environment and the natural world that um, we paid very, very close attention to our responsibilities um, to the environment. Next slide, please. OK, so there'll be a number of residents who would have got uh, through their letterboxes a flyer um, which will would have been a sort of probably A4 or maybe A5 um, talking about forthcoming work on the railway line. They, these are the same um, residents who would have got the flyers back in February and March uh, talking about um, the devegetation work. So this is um, a further update on that. And so what we're actually doing currently um, between, well, it, it start, the work started on the 1st of July and the programme of work runs all the way through to the 31st of August. We're doing some more work on the embankment and on the site where the new station will be built. And our contractors, Amco Giffin, who are the same contractors who did the work uh, back in February, March, are doing this. Um, what they're effectively doing is more embankment works. So they're installing netting and fencing um, and they're actually working uh, partly during the day. Uh, but there is two weekend possessions uh, where they will actually be working from Saturday evening after the train service finishes through to Sunday afternoon in the same way that they did back in, in uh, March. So the two weekend possessions are this coming weekend, the 17th, 18th of July, and then the 14th and 15th of August. The good news for residents, however, is that we're not um, using uh, noisy equipment. Uh, so we're not going to be using chainsaws or wood chippers or anything like that. Um, so the work we are doing is not going to be particularly intrusive. However, um, Network Rail, who obviously are the infrastructure owners, will be bringing through a piece of machinery called a tamper. 
Uh, those of you who are familiar with the railway will know what that is. Those of you who are unfamiliar with the railway, effectively a tamper is a big machine that uh, makes sure that the, uh, the track and the ballast is in uh, good condition and the track geometry uh, is correct so that the trains running over that section of uh, track have a, have a smooth ride. So network rail tamp the railway on um, a sort of predetermined basis. And on one of these possessions, um, and we're waiting to find out from network rail which one it is, they will be bringing this piece of machinery through. Um, but this is a common practice across the entire railway network. It's not connected in any way, shape or form to the work the combined authority is doing to build the new stations. It happens, it would have happened anyway. But it's just really to let you know that if uh, one of these possessions is accompanied by some uh, machinery, it's more than likely to be network rails tamping machine. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the next steps and timescales? So as I've said, we've got planning permission, we've got funding, um, and what we're going to be doing now is looking to award a contract because uh, it won't get built without a contractor being on board to build it. And what we are going to look to do um, is to have a effectively a, a competition um, which will select a contractor to do the very detailed design and then the construction of the three stations. Uh, now, very detailed design is down to you know very fine engineering detail from which a contractor can build the station. Clearly, at the moment we have um, outline design, but you couldn't physically build the station um, from the designs that we have. So the purpose of the detailed design is to actually produce the very high level, of, sorry, the very detailed engineering drawings that will allow the construction to uh, take place. So here are some timescales for you. So it, quarter one of 2022, so um, that's the early part of next year, we expect oh, to we expect to be um, uh, awarding that contract. We expect to be able to say we have appointed this contractor to do this job. Um, and they will then crack on very quickly with the detailed design. They'll hit the ground running. And by the end of 2022, they will have completed the detailed design. They can then move very, very quickly from that into construction, uh, which, was, which will start at the back end of next year. And that will run for approximately 12 months. So what you're then looking at is uh, the completed stations being constructed and ready for opening at the end of 2023. Um, and those of you um, with some railway knowledge will know that railway timetables um, change um, every December with a, with a smaller change every May. So what we are aiming for um, is for the stations to open to coincide with the December 2023 timetable change, because that's the sensible time in which to actually introduce a new service. Um, because it makes sense with the way that the timetables are, are produced. Uh, West Midlands trains are going to be operating the stations. They're going to be running the trains and they're fully on board and signed up to these timescales. So um, I'm now going to open the floor to any questions. And I did see one pop up on the screen, uh, which was about when is the, um, a top, will there be a time soon when the line can be electrified? Uh, now, this is a really interesting question because um, those of you who follow such matters will know that the government is very keen on something they call decarbonisation of the railway, um, which in my simple mind translates into basically electrification of, the, of more of the network. And yes, it would make perfect sense, I think, for the Camp Hill line to be electrified because clearly... Um, the line is electrified at uh, Kings Norton and it's electrified um, at um, Birmingham New Street. However, mm -hmm. um, whilst that might be um, the aspiration of 
the railway industry, there is no funded scheme uh, to electrify the railway. Um, so at the moment, um, yes, the railway at some stage in the future may be electrified. I think that's probably a reasonable statement to make. But at this stage, there is no scheme that's funded. There is no design. Um, it is merely very aspirational. And I think when you look at the logistics of electrifying the Camp Hill line, uh, you have a big problem, um, which is not insurmountable, but Moseley Tunnel is not designed for electrification. And why would it be? It was built in the sort of 1850s, wasn't it? But it is not a traditional railway tunnel. It was designed effectively to hide the railway from the immediate vicinity. And the shape of the tunnel does not lend itself to stringing up overhead wires. So it would be an incredibly complex piece of civil engineering to actually do something with Mosley Tunnel that would allow electrification to happen. Uh, now, it's clearly, I don't want to set any hairs running because that's not my scheme. It might never happen. As I say, this scheme is electrification. It's not funded. It's not in any program. The Department for Transport don't have it in any of their programs. So um, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Thanks, Gavin. Um, that's useful. I, I have got a question. You've answered some of mine and we've got a couple of questions in the chat as well. So my question was around, uh, you said that the detailed design work will be completed in quarter four 2022. So I wondered how your time scale and plan for engagement is ties in with that. So can you give us a little bit on that and then if you can, I don't know whether you can see the chat, Gavin, but we can I can read the questions out if you can't. Um, yes, yeah, some of the questions are popping up on my phone. So our um, comms and engagement um, manager, Caroline Parmenter, who some of you may well have come across, will be leading on the detailed comms and engagement plan for the scheme. Um, I mean, certainly at the moment, um, I think there's probably beyond what I've said, not too much to communicate until we have actually started the procurement process. Um, I mean, the procurement process starts with um, selection questionnaires going out, then invitation to tender, then you'll get, hopefully, from our perspective, hopefully you'll have a healthy um, selection of contractors who are interested. Um, which you will then whittle down to maybe two or three, who you will then do a very detailed um, selection process before awarding. Uh, that's the, the typical route. There are a number of procurement routes. We have a dedicated procurement team who will run that process. Um, but I think once we start the procurement process, that will be the time at which we start um, having a you know a much more frequent and much more robust comms strategy with local residents. Great. I know that um, Izzy in the chat has tied in with my question in terms of asking about will there be any consultation on the detailed design? OK, um, so. We will. Consult, I think the right I think what I, I, I think um, we will consult where appropriate. And what I mean by that is, for example, let's just take an example here. Um, let's say the contractors say we can have this type of paving or that type of paving or the other type of paving. Um, what do you want? Now, that would be a good example of where we could come out to the local community and say, which one do you think fits best in the local area? Uh, and we could engage with people. Um, if the sort of art, the question is by consultation, can you just chuck in the steps and lift at Woodbridge Road? No. Um, so the design is the design. However, you know, the detail of the design. So, for example, I don't know the colour palette of, you know, things. Um, do you want a planter here or do you want a landscaped embankment there? Um, do you want 
seats here or seats there. Um, so, so certainly how the public realm looks and feels, I, I think yeah. I would like to see um, some healthy dialogue and um, local the local community very much engaged. Um, but I, I don't want to um, raise expectations that by consultation you're effectively changing the core principles of the station yeah. we're, we're not going to get longer platforms we're not going to get an extra entrance we're not going to get a staff ticket office or we're not going to get a victorian era station building um, so i don't want to yeah. give people the impression that that's what they're going to get by consultation but certainly within the sort of scope of the design i would like to involve local people uh, where there is a you know a place to do so no, that's really that's really useful, Gavin, and I think that is something that uh, residents would be really interested in 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 having some participation in those sort of discussions that you outlined, because that's going to be a really important part of the process. I know yeah, that um, Fiona's asked a specific question: Will the detailed plans include gates at the top of the access to the platform platforms uh, that can be shut at night? Who will shut? and open them if there are to be gates uh, and right, then right. Okay. Radley yeah. asks I'll give you a couple Radley yeah. asks hi Gavin will the station offer local jobs okay so gates um no the um there are no plans to have gates that are locked or unlocked uh, by uh, the railway um, so in common with, um, I think, most unstaffed stations, um, whilst technically you might have the ability to put a gate somewhere, the reality is you're not going to have somebody come around at five in the morning and open it and 11 o'clock at night and close it. Uh, so in common with other stations uh, around the network, then you will be able to wander on or wander off your that station at any time um, but I would say that that's no different to probably any other station on the network apart from you know maybe major stations in city centres where you've got staff who can pull the doors across um, you know local stations in in you know in the suburbs of cities generally speaking um, you don't have staff there uh, while the train service is running you know completely there will be periods of time where train services are running and the station has no staff so passengers can walk on and off um, out of hours and mostly will be like that um, and there won't be any automatic ticket gates either just to clarify that so you won't be putting your ticket in a machine um, to, to gain access uh, but there will be obviously there are ticket gates at Birmingham New Street that, that that's that's known that's a given uh, local jobs well um, I, certainly while the station is being constructed then um, we would seek to use as far as possible contractors who would draw their resources from the local area and indeed during the procurement process um, contractors are given a, a waiting if you like which is part of the procurement process so you get a waiting um, against a number of factors and one of them is using local labour so there's opportunities during the station construction um, West Midlands trains as part of the, these new stations are actually taking on additional drivers because there's obviously more trains running around the network and more trains means more drivers means more conductors so there will be an uplift in um, headcount through West Midlands trades. Um, I think the other thing to say is that um, stations, when you look at the business case, when you dive into the business case for the station, it actually is good for the wider environment uh, and the wider economy because it encourages growth. It encourages people to travel into Birmingham to access work, education, leisure, but also people to come to Moseley to access work, education and leisure. So I think there's there's probably three things there at play. Um, if the if the if you were looking for a, me to say uh, Mosley's got a fully staffed station and it will create 30 jobs 
and all these people will be at the station. No, uh, that's not the case. But, you know, when you look at the wider socioeconomic factors about what the station brings to the local area, um, what the station brings when you're constructing it, um, and how are you going to service it through additional trains, additional train crew, um, station staff coming up and down and cleaning, then these stations actually do bring a positive employment benefit. Thank you very much, Gavin. I think we've actually come to the end of the time for your segment, um, but that's been really useful. And thank you very much for giving us that update on progress. We'll certainly be inviting you back later on uh, down the line so that we can have another yep. update when you get a bit further into the time yeah. scales. Yeah, I'm really happy to. Um, it's just a, an open invitation. I'm really happy to come and talk to these events and I'm happy to come and talk to any other local stakeholder events that happen. So, um, you know, please feel free if anyone wants me to come and chat to a local group and give an update, then um, please do get in touch. Um, you can get in touch through Kerry or Martin. They've got my contact details and I'll be happy to engage with you. That's very generous of you, uh, Gavin, and I'm sure uh, there will be groups taking you up on that offer. So thank you very much. Okay, and uh, I'm we'll gonna, catch up I'm, soon. I'm going to dial off now. So thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, Gavin. So the, the, the next, we're going to move on quickly because we do want to try and be finished for eight o'clock tonight because uh, we know how draining these meetings can be for all taking part. But our next item is the Commonwealth Games Celebrating Communities Fund. We've got a number of people talking to us about this really uh, exciting initiative. So I'm going to start off uh, by introducing John Moll, who is Community Development and Support Officer for the Council. And then we will be bringing in Laura Easton, who will give us some information on volunteering opportunities. And then we'll bring in our very own Lorna Brewster. So, John, can I pass over to you to uh, start us off? Thanks. Can indeed. Thank you very much, Councillor. I'll just set up a PowerPoint presentation and I promise on what you just said, I will be as quick as is possible. He says immediately failing because I can't find a PowerPoint presentation. I know it's out there. Just while you're trying to find your PowerPoint there, Chris, um, you have it. Sorry, not Chris, John, I do apologise. Um, I. My name is Michelle Young. Laura and the rest of the team and I have been inundated with requests to come and speak to people about volunteering. So I'll be having a chat to you in Laura's um, stead this evening. I hope that's OK with you all. That is perfectly fine and welcome and thank you for giving your evening up to uh, join us. So thank you very much. Can everybody can everybody see that first screen? OK, it didn't look yes. right on my it, it looks completely wrong on my screen. I think something's going on with Microsoft tonight. Um, right. Good evening, all. You might have heard, but we've got the Commonwealth Games coming our way. What we are now trying to do is drum up as much support and anticipation and pleasure as we can possibly get. Let's get to the important bit. Can everybody see that screen? That says we've got thirty five thousand pound coming into the ward. No, Possibly. it hasn't moved on. We're still on uh, the first one. There's something going very strange at mine. Right, I'll have to do it the old fashioned way. It's not going to work the way I wanted it to, but. Is that coming up on anybody's screen as a full screen? I've got it as about a half inch square on my page. We've got the third. We've got three of 17. So we've got the third slide in now, John. What is it is actually showing as a, as a slide on your screens? Yeah. Very bizarre. OK, the only problem is I can't read it because it's so small. <laughs> Right, I'm going to have to try and do this from memory, guys. This is going to be a test for myself. Right, the ward has got £35,000 coming in. The whole idea of this is to try and generate fund and support for the Commonwealth Games. There are three different elements and three different levels of funding you can go for. There's funding up to £1,000. There's funding from £1,000 to £5,000. And there's funding from £5,000 up to a ceiling of £10,000. Now, I will stress again, we have got £35,000. It sounds like a lot. I don't think that's going to be enough, hopefully. And I'm hoping we're going to be inundated with applications. And then I will give an offer to the board in that if we do find we've got more applications coming in than funding that we've got, I will try and support some of those groups to look towards some external funding. We might be able to find some from Big Lottery. And there's about a 
thousand trust and grant organisations out there that we can apply to. So what have we got? There are three funded schemes. There's Get Active, Ready Steady Fund and Celebrating Communities. The first one, Get Active, is exactly what it says on the tin. It is purely about getting people as active as we possibly can. No, oh, my screen's changed again. I don't believe this. OK, right. So this can be everything from actually arranging small community games activities to actually getting sporting activities going, or even just having walkabouts where we have the old 2K walkabouts that worked very, very well in the past. I'm going to have to see if I can find a way now of getting to the next screen because this is no, aha, it's a whole new screen for me. OK, right. Second level, ready, steady, fun. This is about trying to generate some fun for the games. It's about seeing what we can do to do it. There's been some brilliant bids coming in. Some people have applied for some bunting. We've had a couple of street parties proposed. But the whole idea now is to make certain that we, again, generate that link to the Commonwealth Games. And I've got to stress this. Remember to keep the link to the games. We have seen 140 applications coming across the city so far. Of those, I would say at least a third haven't even mentioned the Commonwealth Games and it's Commonwealth Games money. So please, 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 if you're thinking about a project, make certain it aligns with the Commonwealth Games. And the final one is celebrating culture. This is about Birmingham being at the centre, really, of the Commonwealth. And how can we actually generate some interest and celebrate the fact that we are one of the key players of the Commonwealth? And we've had some really good ideas come in so far. I've even got a choir that's been set up that's actually going to start a singing process of different countries across the Commonwealth. So we're trying to keep it as open as we possibly can, as easy to apply as we possibly can, and as community friendly as we possibly can. But again, remember to keep the link to the games. Right. Funding core criteria. Proposals should be able to explain links to the Commonwealth Games. I know I'm stressing it, but I'm going to keep doing it all night. How it supports your local ward plan, all the priorities, how it adds value. So we're not talking about replacing a lost service. We want something that's got something that's a bit new, a bit innovative. But we will also look at existing projects, provided they do tie in nicely with the Commonwealth Games. So what can be funded? Again, we've tried to keep this as open as possible. So funding can be used to cover most types of community activity, including core costs. So you could actually employ somebody if necessary. Revenue costs, new and existing projects that again have that link and one off initiatives. Now, how to access grant application support? You can do this via the NDSU unit, which is where myself and Kay work. I will be putting on the link Word documents. Now, I would suggest I'm old fashioned and I know I'm getting old, but I like the Word document process. And so far, we've had a lot of feedback from our communities saying that they like it from the Word application process. But if you want to get technical, you can go into the Birmingham website. And if you go into Birmingham celebrating communities, you will find a way of actually linking straight into the system from there. Now, right in your application. As I've already said, there are three different levels, up to 1,000, 1,000 to 5, and 5,000 plus. What we must be looking for is it must consider everything that you're going to be doing. So what are you going to be looking at? You need to think about the question itself. So name of the group, which theme you're applying to, which theme you're applying to, the total cost of your project, and how does your activity celebrate the Commonwealth Games? Now, up to a £1,000, we're going to keep this really, really loose. We are not going to be using the usual bureaucratic processes. So we'll keep it as open as we possibly can. Anybody can apply. So schools can apply. Small community groups can apply. Charities can apply. Community interest can apply. Just about anybody. What we are trying to do is keep it as open as we physically can for you all. For £5,000 plus, projects we'd like if possible to think about some of the legacy and continuation yes it's great to have a one-off event but how can we actually have that one-off event carried through into the future and i've already mentioned if we were to set up perhaps a 2k walk then that 2k walk could go on for years and years and years so if we can have something that keeps going that would be brilliant you definitely get a tick in the box for that and writing a good funding bid this is a bit like going to an exam question read the question Read the question, then read the question again before you put pen to paper. 
So read the guidance. It's a very simple process so long as you follow the application. Make sure you're answering the questions that have been asked and be clear both in your presentation and answers and make sure your budget adds up, especially if you're looking at 5,000 plus, because we have got to look for value for money. I've seen some really good applications coming in, but when we start to break down the costs, they're not reasonable. So we do want to see some good quality costs coming in. And the one thing I would say is I am available for some initial consultation processes. So if someone's got a really good idea and they want to talk it through with me, that's not a problem at all. There's a second element to this because we're trying to make certain this isn't Birmingham City Council focus for a change. And what we're actually trying to do is give it more of a community feel. So we've got two fantastic community agencies that are actually going to be working with us. There's a national organisation called Locality and we've got our own local Birmingham charity called Birmingham Community Matters. Now, if you go into the Birmingham Community Matters, and again, go in for, for Commonwealth Games, you will find loads of wonderful tips and advice. Birmingham Community Matters are also running some virtual online sessions for everybody, so you can get some really good ideas of where you want to head with it. And I really, really would recommend that, Birmingham Community Matters. It's a fantastic organisation and they've got some brilliant ideas to help you all through the processes. So what happens next? Hopefully we are absolutely inundated with applications. Now, the initial stage is all bids will be reviewed by Birmingham City Council staff. So that's actually going to be my unit at the moment. We are using a really light touch here. All we want to see is that there is a connection to the Commonwealth Games, that it's good value for money. And if it's over £5,000, then they've got the cost correct. And there's a bit of a legacy, if at all possible. Following that, it will then come back to a specific ward forum to discuss it. So all of you that are here tonight, I'm sure will get the invites to make. Oh, excuse that last bit because that's from a different different spot. Um, there will be a third sector agency that will be helping do it because we don't want it again to be run purely by BCC. We're very conscious that Birmingham City Council officers, especially like myself, that have been around far too long, that we can start to push and prod things into a direction that I don't think they should be going. So we're going to be staying well clear from that and it's back to yourself to make certain it works. The good news, however, is from a finance perspective, it will be done via a condition of grant aid and a COGA makes life very, very simple and very, very quick. We can actually arrange payment within 24 hours. But what a condition of grant aid can also do is if an organisation says they're going to see 100 people, then on that condition of grant aid, we might say, OK, we'll give you 100 percent of the money when we see 100 of your people. But it's open to debate the condition of grant aid, but it's very fluent and it makes things very quick and very, very simple. And if just any questions, basically, Chair, I'm happy to assist as much as I can. Thank you, John. That's uh, really useful and uh, yeah, that really interesting and exciting uh, project for us all to start having a think about. What there aren't any hands up at the moment, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, go straight over to Michelle, and then we'll go to Lorna, and then see if. See if there are some questions at the end for all of you possibly to answer. Is that OK, John? That's absolutely fine, yeah. Absolutely Great. fine. Good evening, everybody. My name is Michelle Young. Can I just first check that I can be heard all right? Yes, you can, Michelle. That's super, thank you. So as I said, my name is Michelle Young. I am a volunteer recruitment and selection coordinator for the Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games. Um, we are in the thrust, in the midst of it at the moment. It's really exciting. I, I do have a presentation, but I'm so cognizant that you are probably fatigued from looking at screens all day. And I, I would rather just have a chat to you about what we're doing um, to recruit the volunteers and a little bit about that, if that's OK with um, you. So we want to recruit 13,000 volunteers for the Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games and the key focus for us is to make sure that these games, although they're the Commonwealth Games and there will be 72 countries coming in to Birmingham and the West Midlands to take part in these games, these are Birmingham's games. So we want the volunteers and not just the volunteers, but the, the OC, as we call it, not Orange County, but the organising committee and the, the volunteers who are part of that to really represent Birmingham. And so we want them to be reflective of all the communities that make up Birmingham. So whether that's people, disabled people and um, people from ethnically diverse backgrounds, people who haven't been involved in education or training, people who are over 50, under 30. We are recruiting all of these groups. We have targets to recruit in all of these groups and we are 
focusing our engagement and focusing our activities really hard on making sure we get a games that looks like the city and a staff and a representation that looks like the city, the host city of the games. Um, so we've got 13,000 volunteers to recruit where applications are open right now. So um, I was just listening. I was very interested actually in the presentation before I was kind of wishing I lived in um, the Mosley area of Birmingham. Um, although my accent wouldn't give it away, I do actually live in Birmingham, but I'm on the other side of the city. I'm on the east side. So I relocated here for, for the job. Um, I've only been with the organising committee for a couple of months. I previously volunteered with the Glasgow Commonwealth Games in 2014 and with the European Championships that were held in Glasgow in 2018. And for me, um, a huge part of my job is trying to convey the amazing feelings and the amazing um, ownership and participation and just solidarity that you feel when you volunteer with the Games. And it's just such an amazing experience for for everyone to be part of. And I would just strongly encourage everyone on here to apply, to consider applying, to spread the word. But also, um, as John said, if you've got groups and, and as um, the speaker from uh, the talking about the train stations, we are more than happy to come out and engage with um, groups, chat to your groups. If you think any groups, community groups, youth groups, um, churches, anything like that who you think might be interested in hearing more about volunteering, actually having a full presentation or a live Q&A with the session, we can provide all of those things. There are over 300 roles for volunteers, so 13,000 volunteers in over 300 roles, and they will be going across many different areas such as sports, accreditation, technical officials, you might be involved in the uniforms, although I'd love to give you more details on uniforms, but even working in the organising committee, we don't even know what it looks like yet. So um, it's the most closely guarded secret in the office at the moment, um, but we're all really excited. But it'll be next April before we find out what's going to happen with that. But all our volunteers will be given a fantastic uniform that will hopefully be able to be worn after and it will be a real statement piece that everyone can look at and say, oh, you were part of the Games. Our volunteers will also be given reward and recognition. So for all the shifts that they do, they will be given um, a little gift. So on shift two or shift four, just as to mark their pathway through the journey with us. You will be given free transport on West Midlands, throughout the West Midlands for the entirety of the Games to get to your places. And you'll also get all your meals and your drinks while you're on shift. So we're going to be looking after our volunteers the very best we can um, to recognise the amazing contribution that they're going to make to our games. Um, we've had, certainly in Glasgow, as a volunteer, I know the feedback to the volunteers was amazing. And when we talk about it, when people talk about the games, they remember the volunteers and they remember the things that the volunteers did. So. Sadly, not many of us are going to be a Commonwealth Games athlete, but many, many more of us could be part of the Games as a volunteer. And my team, um, together with Laura and the rest of the team, we're, we're quite a small team in comparison to the amount of volunteers. There are only uh, seven of us. And um, we've got a lot of volunteers to recruit. We're going to be having a fantastic volunteer selection centre interviewing over 25,000 volunteers in September and October for these roles and um, we'll be looking for pre-games volunteers to help staff the volunteer centre and conduct all these interviews so if you don't fancy being a sporty person maybe you could be an interview type person um, there are so many opportunities to get involved with the games and we really want as many people from the local community to be involved um, I get sometimes that this can be it's a lot of information and people have questions. So I would just ask if anybody I'm going to stop talking now and if anybody's got any specific questions for me, then I would be more than happy to answer them. Um, if it's all right with um, 
the councillor, I would ask if people can unmute and uh, ask their questions. I'm actually blind and it's just a lot easier than me trying to navigate away from chat and having my computer talking in everyone's ears. So if, if that's all right with you or if someone wouldn't mind reading the chat questions, that would be fab. Thanks, Michelle. Um, no I'm happy to read the question or invite people to ask questions because it's lovely to be able to have a Teams meeting where residents have, you know, can fully participate um, in the process. I mean, this this has been such a challenging time for everybody over the last 18 months. And I think having the Commonwealth Games next year gives us something really to look forward to and um, something to have real pride in our city. Absolutely. And I know that the... Um, the um, contribution made by volunteers is going to be absolutely huge. Um, can you um, put a link in maybe into the chat just of where people can find out more information if they want to um, about volunteering? Yep, and sure. Izzy, did you want to unmute and um, actually ask your question to Michelle? Sure. Hey, Izzy. Hi, hi Michelle. <laughs> I think you've got an amazing job if you're recruiting 13,000 volunteers. <laughs> you know, awesome. I don't think about the numbers. I just um, think about the process for 100 volunteers and then do it lots of times. That, that, that's what <laughs> sort of what my question was about. Because I, <laughs> I, I uh, had an email and I've sent in my application. And Brilliant. I just said if, if you've got, and I know it's not easy if you say this, but a sort of rough timeline of how the recruitment process will work. So we're looking at there being a closing date sometime in August and that will be communicated all across our social media channels with all the community groups we've engaged with. Basically everyone and anyone who has made contact with us will get the two week warning and then we'll be doing that annoying countdown. I think that everyone gets on their social media three days to go, two days to go. So people will be well warned. Once, um, if you've indicated that you're interested in helping with pre-games volunteering and you obviously have the necessary skills that we're looking for, people will be being contacted over the next um, few weeks to ask about briefings and training sessions. If you're only interested in the games, you will be invited to come to an interview in that selection centre between September and October this year. And then if you're successful from those interviews, we envisage that offers will be made to volunteers at the start of next year. And your volunteer offer will consist of how many shifts you'll be required to work, um, your venue and your sport. And you've got to accept all of those. And um, you've got to agree to all of those to, to you know, be accepted as a volunteer so although we understand people will have preferences and there's you filled in the application form so you know you can say I want to do this sport at this venue there's lots of scope to state preferences and second choices so hopefully we'll get everybody into a role that they're interested in but as you can imagine with 13,000 and us and the computer making all the decisions sometimes people will be allocated things that they think oh I didn't put that on my form but that's not to say that it won't be a fabulous experience. Um, I got allocated to gymnastics when I was at the European Championships and I was thinking, I don't know anything about gymnastics, but the role was working with um, the athletes and it was absolutely fantastic. Um, just working and just walking athletes around and making sure they were in the right place at the right time, which sounds fairly simple, but when you've got such a big event with so many moving parts, it's actually quite important that people don't get lost and end up down the wrong corridor. So. <laughs> I've got no doubt, Michelle, that, you know, you, you will get 13,000 volunteers and more because I know that there is going to be so much interest uh, across the city for this. Um, what I'm going to do, because nobody else is indicating, Michelle, I'm going to um, in a moment bring in uh, Lorna Brewster from the Mosley Community Development Trust um, because, I mean, Mosley is a wonderful place and we have a really um, active, engaging community um, with community groups that are, you know, that work together on on all of the um, issues and opportunities, uh, which is fantastic. And I know that Lorna has been working with uh, Mosley Regeneration Group and others. So I'm going to ask Lorna if she'd like to come in and um, give us an overview of sort of the thinking about um, what we could be 
putting a bid in, uh, just a starting process. So, Lorna, are you around? If you want to put your camera on so that we can see you. Hi, and then we can uh, come back for some questions afterwards, I think. OK, sorry, I'm having to do this on my phone because I've had to run from a, um, another meeting. So um, a bit about kind of our role in some of this as the Community Development Trust. So John started off by uh, talking about celebrating communities funding. Um, so Mosey Community Development Trust are, uh, will be facilitating the dis community decision making across the whole green constituency. Um, so we're going to be supporting, hopefully, uh, the community working with Kerry and Martin in making decisions um, around the grants. Um, so the first round of grants, um, the deadline's closed. I know John and his team have been madly uh, busy assessing those. Um, and we've started to get a date in the diary. So it's likely we'll do an online decision making for the first round, um, likely to be the 15th of De September, not December, 15th of September. Um, so we will we'll do an online decision making. I think it's a great opportunity for the community to have a say in where this money goes um, and the projects we like to, to support. And then in round two, um, which will be later on in the year or early next year decision making, we're hoping um, that there will be sufficient time that we can really have a much more kind of engaged decision making process, um, which involves sort of a much wider section of the community um, in thinking about the projects to support. So both myself and Rhiannon, who I know many of you all know, uh, know Rhiannon will be involved um, in that. Um, Obviously, it is a great opportunity for us to think about kind of, I suppose, what we'd like to see as a community um, and the types of things we'd like to see. Obviously, the first round's gone, um, but a proportion of funding will be allocated as part of that. But there is 35,000, which is a reasonable amount um, for Mosley. Um, and so it's a, a great opportunity, I guess, for us to think about, as I say, uh, the priorities and how different groups might be able to work together as well. Um, so because we're facilitating decision making, we can't apply, we can't be involved in kind of the, the application process, um, but would really be encouraging groups to, to talk to each other um, and think about what you want to, to apply for. I suppose also as a community to think about what would we like to see uh, by way of, a, even if we're not going to deliver it ourselves, what might we like to see? And then therefore who might be best to do that? So, um, Someone's mentioned to me ideas. I mean, there haven't been uh, applications, you know, things around kind of do we we do our own sort of community games? Um, how do we uh, get sort of schools involved um, as a collective, not just kind of locally? And um, so there's lots of ideas, lots of things that people, ways for people to get involved. Um, and I just wanted to say on Michelle's point about volunteering, I am. Um, many years ago, about 10, 15 years ago, volunteered for, I think it's the European or World Gymnastics um, at the NIA and the basketball. And it was just a fabulous experience over the two weeks. And I just, I'd really encourage anyone thinking about it to, to apply. And Michelle, I think you'll be inundated with volunteers from Mosley. Um, when we did our COVID response, we had over 400 volunteers step forward in uh the case over two weeks so um hopefully you'll get lots of people from Mosley step forward for it thanks Lorna I can see that John's uh, put his hand up so I'll uh, bring John in thank you chair it's just to officially thank Lorna for actually stepping up to the plate on this program because they didn't have to and I know you're in incredibly safe hands with Lorna and the squad so we're very very comfortable and thank you Lorna Thank you, John. We know how lucky we are to have Lorna, uh, Rhiannon and all of the others, because, um, as I said, you know, Mosley is, is such a brilliant place and we have so many uh, different groups that will work together. And that's one of the most important things, I think, with this fund, as Lorna said, and it's to look at what can be done and, and you know, think about that legacy as well, because um, that's really important. I don't know whether anybody else has got any questions, but clearly we will come back and have further discussions um, on this later on, um, you know, in September, once we get nearer the next uh, sort of round of funding. So I haven't got any other hands up. So uh, John and Michelle, thank you very much uh, for, for your presentations. And thank you, Lorna. Looking at the clock, we've got about half an hour left. So I want to um, 
go over to Chris Baggett because Chris has come to talk to us about the triple zero drug and alcohol strategy and um, details of the consultation and wider engagement. So I'm going to pass over to you, Chris, and again, we'll take some questions at the end. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, um, and thanks for the opportunity to um, to meet with the, the forum and to talk about this strategy. I, if it's OK, Chair, I'll just share a few slides from my screen. Is that OK? Thank you. Uh, one second. OK, there we go. Um, can you see that slide show OK? We can. Um, right. Yeah, lovely. Great, thank you. Um, so. Uh, my name's Chris. I work in the public health team in the council. I'm one of the service leads and one of the areas I work on is drug and alcohol uh, work and our approach to supporting people with drug and alcohol addictions across the city. Um, so I'm going to go through these slides as quickly as I can for you. Um, I'm going to talk through. Oh, uh, I hope you can still can you still see my slides? Yes, we can. Yeah, great. Um, I've lost them, so um, I seem to be having the same problem that John did. Um, We're looking at so the shared I'm, vision slide at the moment, Chris. That's fine, thank you. Um, so yeah, we'll be. Uh, I'll be talking through the um, uh, the triple zero strategy and how you can feed into the consultation. So on the um, Triple zero, I'll come to why it's called triple zero on the next slide. Um, but what we want to aim for over this next 10 year strategy that we're developing is um, these two visions for us as a city going forwards with regards to um, supporting people and uh, the impacts that they have with uh, drug and alcohol addictions. So as you can see, we want Birmingham to be a city where drugs and alcohol addiction do not cause uh, preventable deaths um because unfortunately we do see them uh and we want to uh, reduce the damage that uh is caused to people's lives through overdose and crime as well so looking at wider impacts on not only the um those with addictions but on wider society and their families we also want to make sure that young people are not growing up with adults affected by addiction um i hope that's moved on to the next slide uh, it, it has, Chris, but we've just got a title overview of Triple Zero City Strategy at the moment. There's okay. nothing else on there. I'm going to I'm going to reshare my slides so that because this is going to be challenging otherwise. Um, OK. Um, so the reason it's called Triple Zero is because we have three ambitious outcomes that are all based around zero. Uh, we're looking to achieve by 2030 zero deaths due to drug or alcohol addiction, zero overdoses due to those addictions and zero people living with an addiction without the support needed to manage it. Um, and they really are ambitious outcomes uh, based on where we're at at the moment. And at the moment, this is a draft strategy, so there absolutely is an opportunity to feed in through the consultation and help us make any changes that you think need to happen. Um, and once this strategy is updated and finalised through the standard council processes, uh, we'll be using it to determine exactly what we want our drug service, drug and alcohol support service to look like and to do over the next uh, few years. So we've got a number of key elements within the strategy at the moment and at the end of the presentation you'll see a link where you can find the full strategy um, but I'm just going to pull out over the next three slides some of the uh, some of the key points. So we've got a number of key objectives throughout the strategy. Um, reducing uh, access to drugs to illegal drugs and that's looking at access and affordability across the city. And clearly this is not just us working in isolation in the council or, or in public health. This is working across a system uh, with lots of organisations uh, and groups and community networks 
and obviously the police and the police and crime commissioner as well. Uh, we want to reduce the proportion of young people trying illegal drugs in the first place um, so that they don't get on that ladder to um, uh, additional addictions and harm later in life. We want to reduce the number of harmful and hazardous drinkers. Um, we want to increase the proportion of people in treatment um, for both drugs and alcohol. Um, uh, and that, that will include legal and illegal drugs, including prescription drugs. Um, we want to explore what we can do differently and how we can how we can approach things differently to minimise the risk of people overdosing and dying. Um, and we want to look at what we can do around harm reduction um, for people who are at risk of overdose as well. Importantly, we want to ensure that as far as possible, we're supporting people with addictive um, behaviours into secure employment because we know um, we know that's a really important intervention to help people um, recover from their addictions and ensure that they are don't relapse. And like I've said, all of this is about working in partnership across the city with citizens, with um, with networks, with community groups, with um, statutory organisations and partners. So this is our framework for action and this kind of um, divides up uh, some of the key uh, key approaches we'll use as we move forward with drug and alcohol work in the city. First up there at the top, you can see prevention. We really want to um, look at preventing people um, using drugs or alcohol in a harmful way in the first place, so that as far as possible, we minimise the harm to them and, and the community. Where people are, um, are using drugs or alcohol, uh, in a harmful way, we want to look at getting them into early intervention and early support, um, again, to try and um, intervene as, as quickly as possible. We want to make sure that as many people as possible are in treatment support and have the option of recovery pathways um, so that they can address their addiction. We want to reduce the impact on children and young people. That's not just from children and young people drinking alcohol or trying mm. drugs, but it's looking at the impact if they live in households where adults um, or family or friends are using alcohol and drugs, because um, that has a big impact on young people as well. We know that very clearly. We want to make sure that we're working uh, and looking at additional challenges that people face. There was a lot of um, a lot of links between some of these uh, situations you see here homelessness, people experiencing domestic violence, people experiencing mental health issues um, and links between that and alcohol and drug use. And behind all of this, we want to make sure that everything we're doing is based on data and evidence that we have available so that we're, we're addressing the problems that are, are clearly there in a way that is likely to work. The number of golden threads running through the strategy um, the most important is uh, placing the citizen at the heart of everything and ensuring that the citizen comes first in everything we try and do. Um, both supporting them and uh, if they're a substance user or supporting citizens that are impacted by substance use. Uh, looking at the use of regulation and enforcement um, to ensure that um, alcohol sales are, um, are working in everyone's best interest. Um, and looking at where we need to use regulation and enforcement and where it's appropriate. As, you, as I'm sure, sure you're aware, Birmingham is a hugely diverse city uh, with many different communities, and we need to make sure that we understand that and that our, our approach to drugs and alcohol support takes on board uh, the different needs of different communities and any support and treatment options are are suitable and includes everyone. We want to work across the whole city. We, ha we have challenges with alcohol and drugs across the whole city, uh, and we need to make sure that we're working fast enough to achieve these ambitions by 2030. That might sound a long way off, but there's plenty to do. Um, and 
importantly, and one of the reasons I'm here tonight is that we want to learn and listen from people, both people who have um, suffer from these addictions, but also people who are impacted by them or have views on on what we're doing. So we're consulting on the draft strategy, like I've said, um, the consultation is still open. It runs until the 2nd of August, so there's a few weeks left. Um, and you can find the strategy just like you can. Uh, sorry, you can find the consultation just like all council consultations on the Birmingham Bee Herd website. Um, if you if you can find that, just type in triple or triple zero and it'll come up. Or if you Google Bir Birmingham Bee Herd triple zero, it will come up. We'll produce a report at the end of the consultation um, later on in August or September. Um, and we'll we'll be clear about what people have said in their responses and how we're taking that on board by and making any amendments to the strategy before it's it's signed off. So the plan is that once we've got the uh, strategy finalised, we'll then move on to the next step. Uh, our current drug and alcohol services for children and young people and adults run up until the spring of 2023 and then we'll be looking at what changes we want to make based on our new strategic approach so that's how um that's how the the, the pathway will go on once the strategy is finalized we'll be looking at how we need our drug and alcohol support service to change we've worked really hard to get the consultation questions in a format that is understandable and these uh makes sense to people. We've worked with um, citizens across the city to to test our questions. Uh, and I hope if you have a chance to look at the consultation, you'll find that the questions are clear and straightforward. So I just want to highlight because this is this is a really important step. Um, if you access the Be Heard consultation or indeed our Council 000 webpage, there's some really important information there. Now, the obvious one is a copy of the draft strategy so that you can look through it and comment on it while you're completing the questionnaire that we've got online. Um, secondly, um, really important links to our support services. So if people come across this consultation and they they think they've got um, uh, concerns about their drug or alcohol use and then it's really important that they've got the links to access support or if people are, are completing the survey and know of people who uh, would benefit from a referral into services they can find all of the, the information there. Change Grow Live is our adult substance use drug and alcohol use um, support service so there's information about their details and how you can how people can be referred in and Aquarius is the young people's service for drugs and alcohol and finally there's a link to the national talk to frank website which provides really useful information about um about drugs um, these are the key links that might be useful uh, i've already talked about the be heard consultation page we've got a triple zero at birmingham email address if people need to contact us with any questions or inquiries at all. And we've got a birmingham.gov.uk slash triple zero web page. The, the information there is very similar to what you'll find on Be Heard, but you can if you can find the council web page and find triple zero, then that will link you through to Be Heard. And thank you very much, Chair. I'm happy to take any questions if there's uh, time for that. But yes, there is, Chris. Thank you uh, very much. Um, we have got um, a question uh, in the chat function, which I'll read out. And um, I'm sure everybody found that really interesting. And I've put a link to the triple um, zero consultation in the chat function so that people can have a look at that as well. Um, we do know that tackling alcohol and drug addiction is, is you know, it's a really challenging um, area and one that can't be done in isolation by the council. It has to be done in partnership with 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 other stakeholders and um, so it is really welcome this consultation we know that there are discussions within the council around the renewal of um, public space protection orders 
um, and they're currently ongoing. But as you said, Chris, you know, there are so many factors um, to take sort of uh, cognizance of that can lead to addictive behaviours. Um, and unless you're able to provide help and support for some of those, then, you know, it, it's such a difficult um, situation to get any any real solution to. So it is a welcome consultation and I do encourage everybody to um, take part in it. I'm going to read Fiona's question to you um, and then I'm also going to bring in, um, Izzy's got a hand up as well. So Fiona is, is asking, what uh, do you think there are any chances of getting one or more safe consumption rooms in the city? And is there any chance of reintroducing a wet centre such as there used to be in Bradford Street in the 70s or 80s? I mean, hopefully Fiona will um, take part in the consultation and perhaps she can put those suggestions forward. But have you got anything to say on, on that just off the top of your head, Chris? Sorry to put you on the spot. No, that's fine. Um, and thank you very much, Councillor, for, for putting the link in for triple zero. Um, uh, yeah, so. Fiona, um, I think one of the one of the um, one of the strands I, I mentioned was the innovation and needing to innovate around a harm reduction. Um, so you've talked there about safe consumption rooms and. Um, that is that is a challenging environment to to look at. Um, there are all sorts of complexities around that. Um, but but uh, I, I'm sure that will be one of the things we, we, we will want to be looking at if if that's um, based on the feedback within the strategy, obviously, hopeful, hopefully people will will welcome the opportunity to innovate and to look at harm reduction because um, it's really important. Yes, you can um, you can support and intervene with people's addictions and get them off drugs or alcohol, um, but that's it's not always that straightforward. And if people are going to continue to use, it's really important that we ensure that as far as possible they do it in a way that limits the harm they are experiencing and limits the impact on wider society, um, while at the same time supporting them. Um, so yes, do please, um, as the chair has suggested, do please feed that idea into our into our consultation. Um, I must admit, I'm not quite sure what a, what the wet centre in Bradford Street in the 70s and 80s was. I I don't know. Um, I don't know if you're able to um, enlighten me on that one, Fiona, at all. Fiona, did you uh, are you able to enlighten do, but Chris? I bet, I bet Izzy can say it better. Why didn't you go over to Izzy? Okay. Yeah, Izzy, happy to because you've got your hands up as well for a question. Yeah, the the I think the wet centre that Fiona was alluded to was the Trinity um, Church or the old church at the top of Camp Hill which was for a while turned into a place where often the police used to take somebody who was drunk rather than and into the cells. And it, 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 it did work to the extent in, in that it kept them out of police custody, but it had its own issues and challenges, as I'm sure you can you can imagine with a lot of people um, who were, you know, suffering from especially alcohol addiction all in the same place. So, um, but yeah, my my question is more about well i mean because i i i'm an, i used to be a, a police in a police officer including a custody officer and uh, and i know you know the the i, I think it's a really ambitious targets um in fact incredibly ambitious because you know, we've been you know fighting the war on drugs since 1971 um and losing and um but i think it's great and and we've really got to be aiming towards um getting away from criminalisation and into health, make it a health issue. That is absolutely the way forward. And I think that's that, you know, that's the way we're going to lead this, if you're able to lead this. But after I left the police, I also worked with Cypher Fireside, um, who at that time had part of the, together with other groups, had, had the, the contract that changed 
grow live now ha now have um so i had um, and we in mosley we set up the alternative giving campaign to try which is still going for trying to encourage people to give to that rather than give to people on the street because and i, I suppose where i'm coming for, to and um is the housing issue i think that that, that is key you have to link into housing because you have people um, people who, who have substance misuse tend to be the very incredibly vulnerable. They are most likely to become victims, but they're also the most likely to be involved in crime and antisocial behaviour. And they end up going in, around in this cycle of, of homelessness, hostels, poor housing, causing issues, back outs. And so, you know, I think that, that, oh, excuse me, that has to be the... You know that the key. Um, I will. I haven't done the consultation yet, but I will, and that's what I'll be saying. So. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks, thank you. you. See, that, 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 that's really that's really good. And I know that, like me, is is really, uh, you know, active on social media, and you know, we'll be sharing the consultation. I'm sure, and I encourage everybody to uh, to share as much as possible. Uh, John, you've got your hands up. Is that a legacy hand or did you want to come in on this? It's a new one. Thank you, Chair. Um, oh. I'm going to have to declare an interest here, Chair. Normally I'd be very quiet when my fellow officers are talking and I get, but I, I've got a burning passion on this one. I'm actually a trustee of Aquarius, so I come from a very biased perspective, so I've got to state that. Chris, um, when we're commissioning, are we still going to be commissioning one group of alcohol and drugs or are we going to be splitting it as originally was discussed in the early days, going back to an alcohol as a separate contract to a drugs contract? Oh, good question, John. Um, yeah, thanks, John. That's a good question. Um, we don't have a view on that yet. That's something we'll be looking at based on the strat uh, the consultation feedback, what people think works currently, what people think we need to focus on going forward. Um, so if anyone has a view, please feed it in. Um, and we'll be looking at, um, we're, we're starting to look at, this strategy is part of that train of recommissioning uh, the drug and alcohol support services in the city from 23 onwards. Um, it sounds like a long time, but these things take a long time to make sure you get it right. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. No decision on that at the moment. Um, That's good. And, and Chair, if I may, Izzy's touched on a very, very important issue when we start looking at vulnerable people. And what Aquarius is actually doing is we're actually now going to some um, housing providers and offering training and session and counselling sessions with some of their more vulnerable clients because we're starting to realize that they're becoming they're coming abused they're actually ending up becoming drug mules they're becoming victimized in their own right and they're ending up with the, the criminal um, reputation and and cases so we're doing everything we can from that perspective as well from some of a housing perspective because i think it's an ongoing issue and especially when we look at some of our um, multiple occupations we're getting some very vulnerable people so we are actually looking now at housing providers and what we can do to offer services for them no, thanks. Thanks for that, John. Um, we have got a quick question in the chat. Chris, did you did you see that? So Lorna's asking about the chances of commissioning, looking at local neighbourhood support, because as she rightly says, we have got a community worker in Moseley that that works with a lot of vulnerable uh, residents. So if you can answer that sort of fairly quick, briefly, because we've only got a few minutes left and there are a few other quick things that I need to raise. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chair. Um, Yes, um, thanks Lorna, I saw your comment. Um, yeah, please do feed, feed that in because I think I think that local approach um, is a key part of what we want to do. Um, but off the top of my head, I can't think how much we put that into the strategy draft at the moment. So do please have a look. Um, and if it's not there to the extent that you think it should be, please feed that into the consultation. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm sure Lorna will um, and others will. So we'll make sure that that gets fed in because that is really important. And it's not just for uh, for Mosley, but I'm sure other parts of the city will be in a similar situation. Chris, thank you so much. Really interesting. I hope you'll come back and do another session for us when the consultation closes and there's a bit more work done um, on, on the policy, because I think we'd be really interested in in listening and maybe that could be a face to face if it's later you know later on or next year so that would be brilliant thank you very much chris thank you
Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. I, I appreciate that and I'd love to come back again in future. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, just because we have only got a sort of four minutes left, I did want to say that the uh, police update was on the original agenda, but unfortunately, um, Sergeant O'Keefe is on a, a, a day off, yeah, so um, he wasn't able to come. And yeah. um, we were going to have that. Um, it's that little bit there. We made a massive and, difference. And I've gone to the back. I was well. I'm not sure that people, everybody's on mute because I can hear some uh, conversations going on in the background that you might not want us to hear. So uh, you might want to make sure you're all on mute. Um, but I was reminded, actually, that, that, you know, quite a significant part of Mosley comes under Springfield Neighbourhood Police Team. So in future, we will uh, make sure that we seek expanded representation from our police teams, because I think that's really important. And uh, we were very pleased that that, was, that issue was raised with us. Um, we're going to move on to the last item on the agenda, which is local updates and AOB. If anybody has got any AOB, put your hand up. Um, I've got a little bit of AOB. Well, it's an update more than AOB, which I'll give now. So if anybody has got anything they want to raise, please do. So I just wanted to raise um, the work that is ongoing in relation to the Kings Heath and Mosley low traffic neighbourhood. Um, we are meeting officers and the design consultants on a regular basis. We're having uh, weekly or twice weekly meetings uh, with them. Um, we were actually out and did a walk of all of the um, roads where we've had residents raise issues with us and that happened today and there'll be more of that ongoing over the next week or so. And we do hope that we'll be in a position to move to the next stage of engagement and consultation over the coming weeks. We're not quite there yet. So the main focus currently is on the design concept and on the development of options that take into account all of the feedback received. Um, that, that is via the statutory consultation on the Emergency Active Travel Fund measures, um, based on the concerns uh, raised by residents who have lived experience of um, changes to how their roads are being affected by displaced traffic. And of course, from information and feedback submitted um, and received from, from a number of uh, resident groups across Mosley. So there's been an awful lot of information that they've had to go through. So that's where we're at at the moment. We are hoping that we can move uh, towards some well thought out options to put out for consultation and there will be a robust uh, system and process of engagement, uh, which I urge everybody to get involved with. That's all I'm going to say at the moment because you know this is some this is a, an issue that will come back to a future to the, well probably to the next ward meeting and I'm sure that uh, Mosley Forum and other groups will also be wanting to have meetings on this subject as well. So I'm going to leave it there. Are there any questions on that bit? And are there any other uh, items of AOB that anybody wants to raise in the last few minutes of this meeting? I can't see any hands and it's eight o'clock. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming and joining us. Um, hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll have another meeting in early September. Um, clearly, it'll be virtual if it's not still safe to meet up face to face. But we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll work towards having face to face meetings when it's safe to do so. Um, but I will be uh, seeing you guys at different meetings and myself and Martin uh, will be out and about knocking doors every Saturday afternoon um, from now going into the winter months so uh, I'm sure that we will catch up with every one of you at some point so thank you very much everybody and um, good night thanks Marie. thank you thank good you, to see you everybody good to see you all thank you <coughs>